Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. This is the second of a two-part show with acclaimed poet Billy Collins. Thank you for staying with us, Billy. You're very welcome. You're Poet Laureate for the State of New York, mm -hmm. two-time Poet Laureate of the United States. What exactly is the role of a Poet Laureate? Well, uh, you mentioned Howard Nemiroff earlier. He had the office also. And he answered the question by saying that the Poet Laureate's job is to try to answer the question of what the Poet Laureate does. Um, <laughs> it's a, you know, there's a very, like most good jobs, in my point, from my point of view, it's a, there's a very vague job description. Um, you have to perform a little checklist of duties, and they involve going to Washington and uh, giving a lecture and giving a reading at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Poet Laureate is a, um, well, two things to clear up. The Poet Laureate is a employee of the Library of Congress. Uh, he or she is appointed by the Librarian of Congress and the office is in, in the Library of Congress. It has really nothing to do with the White House. So it's not a cabinet post? No, it's not. A, it has nothing to do with that area of the government. And it's also, the, you get a little stipend, which is actually privately funded, so it doesn't take a penny of tax dollars money if anyone was worried about throwing their money away on me or my predecessors. Um, but um, apart from that checklist that you, a few things that you have to do, uh, there's this great opportunity to uh, use the library and the resources there to create some kind of program for poetry, uh, some national initiative. Um, many of my predecessors did that. I think um, before maybe five or six laureates ago, the laureate really didn't do much, uh, kind of hung around the office in Washington and, and there was you know, lots of Washington parties to go to and that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, but it was really Rita Dove, uh, Robert Hass, uh, Robert Pinsky, and now uh, after me, Ted Kuzer, who have each, uh, and me, uh, each uh, initiated some <coughs> national program to uh, raise the profile of poetry and to kind of increase the audience for it. Well, you launched the Poem a Day program, which is still active. What can you tell us about that initiative? Uh, well. When I, w when I decided I had to do something rather than just hang around that office, uh, I immediately thought of high school students. And I think it was because, you know, behind most of these, any initiatives or adult uh, uh, enterprises, there's often an autobiographical secret. And I think the one behind this was that when I was in high school, poetry was really looked down upon. It was not regarded as uh, you know, a uh, cool or honorable thing to do. And so most of my poetry reading and writing in high school was kind of covert. You know, I felt it was, it was something I had to do rather secretly. And I also thought when <clears throat> there's a natural uh, child's love of poetry. I mean, all children are natural born artists. You know, they, they're painters and dancers and musicians and they love rhyming games. And usually, often when they hit adolescence, uh, hormones come in, self-consciousness comes in, and often these natural artistic abilities kind of wither on the vine. And I thought that was the case for poetry in high school. So what I wanted to do was get, um, get um, people to read a poem a day in American high schools. So I took 180 poems, one for every day of the school year. I found 180 poems. It wasn't easy to find 180 really good poems. Uh, that were contemporary. And I set up an internet uh, website connected to the Library of Congress and just invited by word of mouth uh, high school teachers to um, pick these poems off the internet and have students read them or teachers or whoever. You could even have you know, someone from the cafeteria or the grounds committee mm -hmm. come in to make, or the, or the principal to make poetry seem democratic and to make it seem like a part of everyday life rather than just something to be studied. Uh, and I felt if students heard a poem every day and then went off to class without having to write about it or 
figure it out or discuss it or react to it, just heard a poem, <clears throat> they would either get it or not get it, but it, eventually every student would probably connect with some poem. Um, so that d developed into these two, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, two uh, anthologies uh, in which I found 180 more and then 180 more poems again. And these two collections are not so much, much aimed at just high school students, but they're really for anybody who has drifted away from poetry and is looking uh, for a way back in. Uh, the 180 now means more of a kind of turning around back to poetry. Um, and these are you know, 360 good, clear, contemporary poems that you can reread your, as many times as you want, but most of them will give you something on the first reading. Uh, so they're not modernist poems that you need to figure out. They're poems that deliver an injection of pleasure and comprehensible um, pleasure um, on the first reading. What are some of the misconceptions you want teachers and students to get beyond when it comes to poetry? Well, I guess the main, main uh, gridlock that I'm trying to loosen up is the uh, insistence that the only way to approach poetry in a classroom uh, is through uh, interpretation, is through figuring out what the poem means. Now that's one pleasure, it's a, but it's a very conceptual pleasure, and for students it's often a very intimidating pleasure, or intimidating pain, I should say. Um, a phrase I am fascinated by is when a teacher says to a student, they, let's, let's say we read an Emily Dickinson poem, and the teacher says, well, what do you think the poet was trying to say? Now, what this implies is that these poets have failed to say what they wanted to say. They were trying. So Emily Dick Dickinson failed to say what she wanted to say, but we here at the Edgewater Middle School, <laughs> if we put our little heads together, we can help her figure out what she was trying to say. Um, and it was trying to it was trying to encourage stu uh, teachers and students to move away from just hunting for meaning and just enjoying some of the other less stressful uh, pleasures that poetry is ready to deliver. In your introduction to the Poetry 180 books, you say that poems are very similar to eye charts. Help us make that connection. Um, well, I thought uh, <laughs> that it's, it's sort of I'm, I'm working on a diagram of a poem or a model of a poem that begins with something very clear and ends with something less clear. So I thought I could analogize it to an eye chart where you have this big E at the beginning, and so everybody can see the E, and then as you read down the chart, you will reach some level of illegibility where you are squinting and you can't tell a P from a B from a C, and then you give up, and then they know how what to lenses to prescribe. Um, and I think uh, a good poem for me is a poem that begins with this clarity where you feel very oriented and, um, and but it leads you into an area that is where things are not quite as easily uh, decipherable into areas of ambiguity, uh, ambivalence, and mystery even. Um, Robert Frost is a good example. Frost's poems always start out very simple. We know exactly where we are. We're walking in a woods. We're stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Um, we're picking apples. Uh, we're two men are putting a fence together, back together. Um, but within 10 lines, 20 lines, 30 lines, the poem has expanded to be about some very uh, kind of universal and insoluble things about the irrevocability of uh, decisions, um, of our way of handling our past and our future, um, the whole notion of time. So, uh, so I think if, if a poem starts, um, I like the mystery to be at the end and the clarity to be at the beginning. Billy, we live in a high-tech age. You know that, we all know that. We all have computers. Just a moment ago, you were wondering where you could get a computer hookup here at the, at the hotel. 
What do you say to people who ask you, what place does poetry have in contemporary society? Well, probably as a retardant uh, to the kind of acceleration that we, uh, that we are all uh, swept away in through, uh, when, when we, I mean, high technology basically means speed. Um, I've caught myself doing this, you probably have too. Uh, you punch in something on the computer and you get furious because you have to wait four seconds for some piece of information, which um, 20 years ago you would have had to get in the car and go to a library to find out the answer. Um, so along with this thirst, I mean, the desire for speed is unquenchable. Uh, and that's what's so uh, insane and pernicious about mm -hmm. it, I think, is that things can't go fast enough for us. You say you can fit an encyclopedia on this CD. Well, why can't you fit five encyclopedias on it? And, I mean, that kind of um, scientific desire for smallness and speed are, are kind of infinitely insatiable. Um, what poetry tells us is to slow down. One of the things poetry does is slow us down. It retards this desire to rush through. Uh, one of the just common ways it does it is that it's, it's broken into lines and stanzas. So unlike prose, you can't just kind of speed read through it. The line breaks and the stanza breaks uh, and other poetic devices are really ways to kind of impede uh, or, or sl uh, slow down your natural desire to rush through things. And that, that slowing down to a more meditative and thoughtful pace is, uh, I think, a good counter to, um, to this media craze we have with uh, acceleration. The Poetry 180 anthologies focus on contemporary poets, and I wondered what you think about some of the historic poets. You've mentioned Robert Frost. What about Walt Whitman? Uh, well, Whitman is, um, Whitman, uh, personally, Whitman taught me intimacy. Uh, that's one of the things. Whitman teaches us a kind of wildness, uh, a breaking of rules. He's the first really American poet in that he's a completely non-European. You know, he breaks away from the metronome of the you know, regular beat in poetry. He abandons end rhyme. And he was the first poet to get rid of both of those things, uh, to take off those, those trainer wheels, if you will, and just uh, speed along without those governors. Um, but he also is the poet of uh, extreme intimacy. Uh, in some of his poems, where he talks about the readers of the future, uh, particularly a poem called uh, On Crossing a Brooklyn Ferry, he says, as, you know, as, as I am standing here, you will stand here. As I looked at this water, you will look at this water. Uh, and it's a, you get an eerie sensation that how did he know I was going to be here? Uh, and in many of his poems, you can feel a kind of hand on your shoulder. He's, uh, there's no poet that speaks to the reader, I think, with such uh, incredible directness. It's not a persona. Mm -hmm. It's as close to the poet himself speaking right at you as you can get. One of my favorite Billy Collins poems is Taking Off Emily Dickinson's Clothes. Did you feel the least bit sacrilegious when you were pulling the pins from her hair? Well, of course. I mean, that's why I did it. I wanted to mean, I think one thing you can do in poetry is make mischief. You don't have to be on your best behavior. Um, I think I, it's one of the few poems I've written that started with the title. I, I don't know why the title came into mind, but once I had the title, I thought I should go ahead and see what it would be like to actually take her clothes off. Um, and I think the other motive was maybe to be a little sacrilegious because she had become such an icon. But also, around the time I wrote that poem, there was a lot of speculation in biographical uh, books about her, uh, about her sexuality, about was she uh, a virgin, was she bisexual, did she have sex? And I considered it seemed to me at some point it just got to be kind of um, National Enquirer level of gossip. And I thought, well, maybe I could react to that just by taking your clothes off and uh, having sex with her. And that that would, at least for me, that would answer the question. Have you ever thought about undressing Christina Rossetti? Uh, no, I'm going to stop with Emily. Yeah, I have to be, I have to be faithful to my, <laughs> my one poetry woman there. 
your latest collection, The Trouble with Poetry, and, and I ask you before we started today, and you generously agreed to read this wonderful poem, Constellations. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, Constellations. Yes, that's Orion over there. The three studs of the belt clearly lined up just off the horizon. And if you turn around, you can see Gemini, very visible tonight, the twins looking off into space as usual. That cluster, a little higher in the sky, is Cassiopeia sitting in her astral chair, if I'm not mistaken. And directly overhead, isn't that Virginia Woolf slipping along the river ooze in her inflatable canoe? See the wide-brimmed hat? And there, the outline of the paddle, raised and dripping stars. What a great poem. Well, that's a poem with a little little um, detour in it, or a little shift in it. Uh -huh. um, apparently, she had an inflatable canoe, and she used to paddle up and down that river. I read it in a biography of hers. And, of course, the other irony is that that was the river that she drowned herself mm -hmm. in. So this is kind of picturing her um, um, kind of, you know, involved in a kind of recreational sport before uh, before she used that river for a fatal purpose. She, of course, was a great novelist and essayist. As a poet, are you often inspired by writers from other genres? Oh, absolutely. And I think when often when a poet is asked who, in, who inspires you, who influences you, uh, the answers are restricted out to other poets. I was just as influenced by uh, reading decadent literature like Walt, I mean, Walter Pater or Huysmans or um, Ronald Furbank. Uh, I was influenced by uh, reading Hemingway. I mean, Hemingway taught me, if I've learned anything, how to write a good sentence, or at least he uh, provided a model uh, against which I, I think unconsciously, but I kind of measure my sentences. Um, I would say uh, 19th century landscape and still life painting had an influence on the way I see things. I would add that watching Looney Tunes and Mary Melody's cartoons as a child uh, was highly influential on my imagination in that it showed me this world that was strangely pliable and uh, in which uh, the laws of physics are suspended and uh, characters can, even characters with three fingers can accomplish all kinds of uh, all kinds of tricks. You're also a jazz enthusiast. Has jazz influenced your style at all as a poet? No, I, I don't think there's any real overlap there. Um, I, I never tried, I, I think jazz is a good subject matter, but I, I don't think it's any different from uh, the weather or my dog or the house I live in. Uh, it's just another thing that's in the atmosphere and that I provides me with metaphors and subjects. Um, there's a good deal, there are a couple of books of jazz poetry or jazz mm -hmm. anthologies. I would never try to write a jazzy poem that tries to sound like jazz. Uh, I can't stand those poems. Um, and I can't stand the kind of, it's usually, these poems are usually written by white middle-aged professors uh, who like to say like Miles as if they actually drove around with him in his Ferrari. Um, uh, the difference between poetry and jazz is more interesting than the similarities to me. Uh, the difference is that jazz is, pure jazz is improvised. It's real spontaneous composition. It's creation on the, at the moment. Uh, poetry is not improvised. Poetry is the result of revision. I mean, I'm holding a pencil in my hand uh, and it has an eraser on it. Uh, there's no eraser on a saxophone. There's no eraser on a trumpet. You know, when you're playing real jazz and improvising, you are creating on the, at the, on the moment. If poetry wants to sound spontaneous, that might be something it shares with jazz as a product, end product. But spontaneity in poetry is the result of revision. Um, there's a, a couple lines by Yeats that sum that up. He says to poets, uh, all our stitching and unstitching is for naught if it does not seem a moment's thought. So taking the poem apart and putting it back together four or five times is a pointless activity unless what the reader reads seems like the, the, uh, the thought of just the moment. 
it's National Poetry Month and you're traveling across the country and doing readings. How important is it to you personally to share your poetry in a public forum? Uh, well, it's a dramatic way to get it out there. It, um, I suppose reading out loud is this kind of extension of, of the page in some way. Um, although there is, um, and it's a, it's a good way to just, you know, publicize poetry and to have people come together to have this common, uh, common affection for poetry. Um, there's a, it's a little odd because I don't write for the public. I don't write for public situations. I don't write for the podium. I write for a, a single reader sitting in a room alone, reading in silence. And I am, I compose my poems usually sitting in a room uh, in silence. And, and so it's, you know, it's one, a poem in, cre created out of one silence going to interrupt another person's silence, not reading to you know, a, a big audience of people. There's, there's two things that you miss when you uh, hear poetry read out loud. One is you don't see the shape on the page. And poetry always does make a shape. It's not like prose that just fills the page. It makes a little verbal sculpture. It has a shape and contour to it. And you, you miss that kind of visual. Uh, as you miss That's not audible in a poem. And the other thing uh, is that when you hear a poem read out loud, you can't, you don't know when the ending is coming up. When you have a poem in your hands, you obviously can see, you know, the white space below, and you can make emotional preparations for the ending, and you can even pace yourself so that, I mean, you know, okay, we're getting ready for the ending, and here's the ending. Um, when you hear a poem read out loud, you don't know when the ending's coming, and you might even suspect that this poem might be going on for another 45 minutes. So there's that, uh, there's that fear, too. You've recently written an introduction to a book edited by Teresa Welford. Tell us what we need to know about this book in this poetic form. Um, well, the book is called The Paradell, and it has a strange history. Um, uh, a number of years ago, I wrote, uh, well, I wanted to, I wanted to, I had the, well, let's go back to a quote by W.H. Auden, who said that there's nothing funnier than bad poetry. Um, you know, bad poetry is funny the way bad movies are funny. Are funny. Um, so I thought it would be funny to write a poem, a formal poem, that was uh, ridiculously incompetent. So to write like a terribly incompetent bad sonnet. Um, and, but then I realized there are so many bad sonnets and bad other forms, I have to make up my own form and make it bad that way. So I made up a form called the Paradell, and um, it has some very simple rules, and then it has this incredibly complicated rule, which is the equivalent of like making a 300-point letter out of all consonants in a Scrabble game. It's just really hard to do. <laughs> um, and I, I wrote this poem, and it was intentionally botched. So there were all these leftover words at the end, and the form is way over the poet's head. Um, and I thought that would be the end of it. It was published in The American Scholar, um, because I, the editor then, um, um, uh, Daniel Epstein, had, has a very good sense of humor. I knew he'd get it. Uh, but then letters kept started coming into the American Scholar, people complaining. You know, this is the organ of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Mm -hmm. And um, they were complaining about the fact that this poem was so badly written. They thought it was disgraceful that the American Scholar of all magazines would publish such a sloppy poem. And one fellow wrote in that he said, this is the worst paradell I've ever read in my life. You know, and so... Epstein was going to publish one of these representative letters, and he asked me if I would respond. So I said, sure, and I, uh, I wrote back, and uh, there were, the letters appeared in the magazine. And I just, I didn't, I didn't want to give it away, of course. Um, so I said that I just, I tried my best. I said I, that was the best I could do. I said it's a very difficult form, and I'm sorry if it wasn't perfect, and I know I have my flaws, but I... You know, I said, you try it. <laughs> it was a very difficult form. <laughs> well, then I heard that the Paradell was being assigned in classes, in, in writing workshops around the place. And then uh, this uh, professor from a college in Georgia called me up, Teresa Welford, wanted to know if, if she could do a, uh, an anthology of Paradells. 
And uh, this is a long story, but I told her <laughs> to go ahead and, and uh, I would write the introduction. And uh, so she got she called me back and a couple of weeks later, and she said, I can't seem to find any other paradels. Well, um, and I said, well, not many people really tried this form. It's just really hard. And maybe some of them keep, keep looking, you know. I was just being like, <laughs> sadistic at this point. And then I realized she's probably trying to get tenure and she wants to get a book out of it. So I confessed to her that I just made it up. But um, she, you know, I kind of, t we kind of talked about it and, and we discovered this, this still would be a viable form, that forms have to come from somewhere. So she sent out like a hundred letters to a hundred poets asking them to write a paradel. And we took the best of them and uh, she put them into this anthology. I wrote an introduction called A Brief History of the Paradel, and, um, and the book just came out a couple of months ago. Mm. So it's, I've actually invented a new form. Well, that's got to be very gratifying. It is. Do yeah. you have any idea how many poems you've written all together? I don't know, hundreds. I suppose it's hard to say, 400? You've compared poetry to travel writing. Where do you go from here? Uh, geographically? Geographically and, and, and oh, figuratively. Okay. Um, well, I'm just, I just write one poem at a time. I don't have uh, a major scheme. I don't have a theme for a book or uh, I never have think of poetry as sort of a project. It's basically like, uh, I suppose like songwriters. You just write a song then you try to write another song. So it's basically, um, I'm looking forward to writing a poem before too long. Thank you for being here, Billy. You're very welcome. And thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.